but he that keeps the law, happy is he. So I just want to pick out that first phrase that says, where there is no vision, the people perish. It's important for Israel during the Old Testament. It's important that they establish a vision for the nation. It's important for leaders to be able to capture the vision that God is giving them. And it's important that we do today understand that without a vision from God, then we're leading towards uh, destruction or we won't have the kind of accomplishments that we want to enjoy in our ministries or in our lives. I became pastor of Bible Church International in 1996. Uh, I came in during the last Sunday of July and then the Lord has allowed me to be the pastor until today. And if I look at the ministry uh, of Bible Church International from the time I became the pastor, there are two memorable occasions where we had a time of envisioning. And I'm sure many of the people who have been with Bible Church International from that time I came in, they can also uh, affirm these two occasions of envisioning. First is in 1999. Since our leadership was looking forward to year 2000, the beginning of a new century, you know, we felt that it's necessary for us to prepare our church for a new vision. And out of uh, the leadership, strategizing, working together, we believe that God gave us a vision. And, and there were two things that we said we wanted to do. Number one, uh, we wanted to begin looking at the possibility of setting our facility in Garfield and begin pursuing a bigger property which can accommodate growth for our church. And uh, the other part of the vision was for us to begin being intentional in building a staff. During that time, I was the only pastor and uh, we had a part-time choir director and we also had a part-time pianist. So that's all about what we had as far as staffing for our church was concerned. Now, the result of that envisioning in 1999, in 2008, the Lord has blessed us. He has moved us to this facility in 2008. And uh, after many attempts to buy a property, finally we saw the Lord's hand leading us to this particular property 33 miles away from Garfield. But we believe that this is what the Lord has given us. And in relation to the second vision of building a staff, today we have seven full-time workers, two part-time workers, and one volunteer pastor who is at the same time missionary for the North American Mission Board. Many of you are familiar with Pastor Steve Allen. And we, we praise God because in 1999, he led us to foresee the possibility of having a bigger facility and building a staff. Another occasion happened in 2010 when we decided since we are in a bigger facility that we have the responsibility to fill this place with people. And so because of that burden, it led us to have a vision of discipleship. And if you're familiar with T12, we specifically stated our vision as raising a generation of disciples. And we believe that this is where the Lord wanted our future to be. And as a result of that envisioning in 2010, today, the Lord has blessed us from having eight small groups during that time. Now, uh, as probably some of you are doing, we divided our congregation in several geographical locations or some affinity groups like our praise team had their own small group. And from eight small groups, now we have 66 cell groups. 
being led by our people. And aside from that, from having 250 uh, regular attenders today, we praise God because we are able to gather 480 uh, members and attendees, which already include, of course, our children and many of uh, the people that our cell leaders are hoping to bring the rich for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank God because we are seeing a lot of new people, a lot of new faces joining us for our worship service. And two occasions of envisioning, and we saw how the Lord had used those times of envisioning in order to affect BCI for where it is right now. I'd like to quote the words of George Barna in his book, Turning Vision into Action. He said, the future doesn't just happen. It is created by visionary leaders, people of distinctive foresight and unflappable conviction literally create the future. Now, I'm sure, just like me, all of you who are leading your churches are thinking of greater future for your church. And we are conscious of being able to move our church to the next level. We really need to make sure that we are able to identify the vision that God is giving us. And, and that's why we have this lecture this morning, because we need to be convinced that the future of our churches will not happen accidentally. You, know? you will not wake up one day and, and realize that you have a bigger church, you know, or you have moved to the next level. You really need to begin asking the Lord, if you don't have a vision yet, a specific one, to start helping you understand, identifying what that vision is, and, and be able to properly strategize in order for you to achieve the vision that God has given you. So, let's begin with the idea of vision, how to fulfill it, and how to support it. Let me begin with the concept of God's vision. If you look at the scriptures, you could find so many occasions wherein God is sharing a specific vision to specific individuals and, and specific leaders. For example, in the Old Testament, you have the example of Moses. He was already tending sheep after he fled from Egypt. And all of a sudden, the Lord spoke to him in a burning bush telling him exactly what God wanted him to do. And, and of course, you find that in Exodus chapter 3. Another individual is the Apostle Paul. He gave his testimony to King Agrippa in Acts chapter 26, telling that he has been obedient to the vision that God has given him. And of course, you know how that happened. He was on the road to Damascus, and all of a sudden, the Lord Jesus Christ interrupted his life. The Lord Jesus Christ literally turned his life upside down, asking him to fulfill this specific vision of becoming God's chosen servant or vessel to the Gentiles. And then, of course, you have Jesus Christ, our perfect example of having a vision of what God wanted him to accomplish while he was still here on earth. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And watch this next couple of words. It says here, For who, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning in shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The Lord Jesus Christ, according to this particular text, was able to endure the sufferings on the cross because of the results that that suffering could bring, you know, into the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, you see, if you're going to look at this text in Hebrews chapter 12, you and I can get the impression that as we pursue God's vision, there's this possibility that we will have to endure some 
sufferings, and yet because of our vision, we would be able to endure them because we're excited about what God could bring in into our ministries because of the vision. So, what is God's vision if we're going to define it? Let me say that if we're thinking of vision per se, we always try to define this, define this as a mental picture or image of the days ahead. So vision is always related to the future, days ahead. And, and, and when we talk about vision, this is something that God impresses to you and, and God allows you to begin, cre to begin creating this mental image of how you see your you know, life probably five years down the road or ten years down the road. With regards to God's vision, and there's a big difference between your vision in your own personal life and, and God's vision for your church. When we think of God's vision, we have to be able to define this as, you know, God's communication of what He wants to accomplish through us to build His kingdom. So, with our personal vision, we have a mental image of what we would like to see happen in our own personal lives. But in terms of God's vision for us, the, the emphasis is how you and I has been impressed with this image with regards to how God would help us accomplish something for the building of His kingdom. Like if God has given you a vision for your church, you know, it is very much related in the expansion of the kingdom. So when, when you say it's God's vision, definitely it's not for your personal glory. Right? If it's God's vision, it's not for your personal name's promotion. But it is for the building of the kingdom of God. And, and that's probably an important issue that you and I need to always confront when, when we're talking about God's vision. You know, when, when we begin to introduce uh, to our leadership, if you're a pastor, the future of the church, you just have to make sure that it's not about you or it's not about the leadership of the church. It's, it's about the building of God's kingdom. Amen? Now, I think with regards to God's vision, we need to be able to ask, how do we know whether or not it is a God-given vision? Right? And in our experience, and if, even if you look at the scriptures, I think a good gauge that it is a God-given vision is when you realize that that vision has a God-sized factor. Meaning there are some parts which are possible for you to accomplish out of your own strength. Now I remember when we started thinking about uh, selling our property in Garfield and buying a new property. During that time, it seems that that particular vision was ridiculous. We already have a chapel and we're not even full in that particular place. Why are we thinking of you know, moving to a bigger facility when our people know that it's going to cost us a lot of money? It's not easy to think of you know, buying a property when you are in Metro New York area. But that makes it God's vision in a sense because it is not something that you alone would be able to handle without God's intervention. Once it is God's vision, then it's God who provides. Amen? Amen. There are some parts which are impossible. And, and if you look at Numbers chapter, I think, there are two chapters that you need to be able to read in order to understand this. Numbers chapter 13 and 14, and I will always go back to this particular passage. When it was time for 
the nation of Israel to go to the promised land after they left Egypt. If you can still remember, God allowed them to send 12 spies into the promised land. And out of the 12 spies, there were only two out of 10, out of the 12, who said, let's go for it. We know we could do it. That was Joshua and Caleb. And then the reason why Joshua and Caleb believed that it was possible for them to conquer the promised land despite the giants that, you know, the rest have reported is because they believe that this vision came from God. It seems impossible, but because it came from God, then it's doable. And, 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 and I hope if this is the only thing you could get out of my lecture this morning, it works already. Because I believe God would constantly challenge us to move out of our comfort zones and fulfill something that on our own personal estimate, there's no way we could do it. And yet, once we begin to surrender ourselves to God and His power, His blessings, then we would be surprised what God would be able to accomplish in our head. Amen? Amen? So, let's move on. Let me also help you understand why having God's vision is important for our churches. I put at least three here. Number one is that God's vision provides priority. Now, this is really important because just like our church and your churches were filled with so many activities, so many programs. In fact, one of the most difficult part in our church life is to be able to streamline all the programs. And if you don't have a vision, you'd realize that you have a lot of programs which are not bringing results into your church. And, and I think one of the downside of uh, being in close proximity with other churches is that we see what other churches are doing. And so if we feel that some of these churches are doing something good, we tend to just copy, copy, copy. But if we're not familiar or if we're not aware of what God wants us to accomplish, a lot of times we're copying a lot of programs which are not matching our vision. And so it, it's important that we have a vision so that we can streamline our programs and activities. Now, how many of you feel that your church has so much activities that you feel people are beginning to really burn out? Now, it would be good for our leadership to again go back Sometimes it's hard to say we don't need this, we don't need that, but it's necessary because we want to be able to maximize you know, our output as a church. Second is vision promotes passion. God's vision can bring excitement and energy to God's church or to the people of the church. If your church don't have a vision, then you won't have a passion. People are we're not excited about the church. That's why one uh, book or leadership book, I think it's Bill Hybels who said, when <coughs> your people are bored, you probably need to go back and see if you don't have the proper vision in your midst. Or if you already have a vision, probably you have to reinvent your vision just to be able to make people feel excited about your ministry. And that's true, you know? We need to be able to understand that vision affects passion in relation to our people. And number three, vision propels productivity. Because you are more focused on what you want to accomplish than you can pull in the resources of your church, and, and we don't have a lot of resources. As much
much as we want to accomplish a lot, I'm sure you all can agree we do not have all the money that 